I have been asked to address the Indian Behavioral Science Convention, ISAP's Convention on uh, 16th of November on behavioral science contributions to individuals, groups, organizations, communities and perhaps the country. It's a great privilege and honor to be uh, called to give this keynote speech in ISAPS. I have not been active in the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Sciences for almost now uh, over 15 and odd years. The last I remember was doing a uh, extension motivation lab along with uh, Paul Ceremony almost about 10 years ago. And before that, uh, uh, along with Uday Parikh, a 360-degree feedback-based laboratory, uh, both at uh, Goa. Before that, again, with a gap of almost about 10 years after I uh, uh, completed my term as the president of uh, the ISAPs. In the U.S., if you ask anyone to talk of behavioral science contributions, you will normally not talk of institutions or organizations. You will talk of individuals. Uh, even sitting here in India, if somebody asks me who are some of the famous behavioral scientists who have contributed to our understanding of human behavior, applied or not applied, I think all behavioral science has to be applied. Otherwise, it doesn't become a, a science. Uh, I will... Uh, like most of you would start with uh, to start with Freud, Sigmund Freud, Alfred Adler and Carl Jung, the psychoanalysts. And after the psychoanalysts, I think comes a large number of uh, theorists who have contributed to our understanding of human behavior and human personality. You will perhaps talk about Raymond Cattell, who organized all the uh, qualities human beings can have that can be found in the dictionary and did a factor analysis and came up with uh, a number of factors and later evolved a tool uh, called 16 personality factor inventory, Canadian psychologist. Then you remember H.J. Eisen who of course contested the psychoanalyst theory and then suggested that behavior change can easily occur by reinforcing behaviors or punishing behaviors that are not desirable and rewarding behaviors that are desirable. And you don't need to go into years and years of prolonged psychoanalysis, go and study all the details and so on. So H.I. Eisen's contributions are also in our understanding of extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, emotional stability and a whole lot of other kind of things. So you will remember H.J. Eisenk as a behavior scientist. You will also remember the original contributions of uh, Henry Murray, who identified a large number of motives as constituting our personality. And of all the motives, which included, I think, need for achievement, need for affiliation, need for aggressiveness, need for nurturance, need for uh, even narcissism, and so on and so forth, 30 and odd motives and developed a wonderful tool called Thematic Perception Test. So we will remember Murray. And following Murray's contributions, we will remember the greatest applied contributions in behavioral science made by David McClellan, who picked up for many years achievement motivation as a motive and demonstrated that it is possible to help people to become entrepreneurs by developing achievement motivation or achievement thought and associated constellation of behaviors. He not only uh, wrote a wonderful book which became a classic even today, The Achieving Society, where he demonstrated that uh, the, uh, the kind of socialization that takes place in early childhood, the kind of stories that are told to communities will eventually result in economic development of this country. So achievement, motivation and economic development were correlated. And he demonstrated by coming to uh, India and experimenting in 
an institute called the C8 Institute, Small Industries and Training Institute, where he picked up groups of uh, people uh, who are uh, more service oriented people, agriculturists, farmers, and so on, and developed achievement motivation in them and demonstrated it is possible to uh, make them entrepreneurs. Well documented in a book, Motivating Economic Achievement. So you will remember David McLean. You will also remember David McLean for his sub subsequent work on power motivation, where he wrote this wonderful book called Power the Inner Experience and talked of various sources of power and also talked of the two dimensions of power and so on. So we'll also remember in the industrial uh, behavior, organizational behavior tradition, people like uh, uh, Kurt Levin, of course, a topologist, a mathematical theorist, who conceptualize life as consisting of a series of forces acting on you all the time. So it's a field, it's a field theory. And gave us very good tools like force field analysis and gave us T-group theory and eventually the NTL Institute of Applied Behavioral Sciences, which was based on the foundations he laid on changing human behavior using uh, participative methods, using groups and things of the time. So we will remember Kurt Levin <coughs> and his contributions to applied behavioral science. We will also remember in the organizational behavior tradition people like uh, Douglas McGregor for his theory X and theory Y, Henry Winsberg, and uh, uh, people like uh, uh, the two factor hygiene uh, motivator uh, theory uh, of Herzberg. And you will remember Vincent Lickert and his book on New Patterns of Management, who did a lot of work on the importance of organizational climate and used its survey research method or survey method as bringing change in organizations and communities and so on. I think these are all very, very interesting kind of people and each behavioral scientist had his own way of looking at human behavior and expanded on this and left us with a series of tools, be it an MBTI or a 16 personality factor inventory or a organizational climate uh, survey uh, questionnaires or uh, grid methodology of uh, Blake and Morton and so on and so forth. So behavioral science in the West is known by the people, the theorists and the theories that they have performed it. Very rarely we talk of the University of Michigan or Harvard University or Stanford University uh, and universities like that. Uh, but interestingly, it is these universities that facilitated the development of all these, the, the work by all these great people. When it comes to India, I am not very sure how much we talk of individuals and their theories. Perhaps there are very limited theories that are there. Or perhaps the individuals largely borrowed from the West and therefore they are not known for any original contributions. If anyone takes this position, I will perhaps be the one to totally disagree with it. And I would perhaps propose that India is one country where we respect our neighbors a lot more than what we respect people within our own country. The farther you are located from India, the more respect you get from us. And the closer you are to us, we will take you for granted. Uh, having said that, I must say that the contributions of Indian behavioral scientists are no less. I do not wish to compare <coughs> the Indian behavioral scientists with American behavioral scientists or the German psychologists and so on, but I think each one of the Indian behavioral scientists stand on their own. They are a lot more application oriented. They are a lot more synthesizing. They are a lot more learning and disseminating. If somebody discovers something in the US, I think we are very good at disseminating. I mean, the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Science is a good example of how we have disseminated Kurt Levin's Central Institute of Applied Behavioral Science. 
But having said that, I must say that Indian behavioral science also has something to stand on its own. I would like to mention a few names and mention the great contributions some of these gentlemen have made to our understanding of human behavior and particularly the application of human behavior in a variety of sectors. I would start with the most important person in my own life who has influenced me the most and with whom I had the privilege and opportunity of working for almost all throughout my life and that was Uday Parikh. Uday is known for his concept of extension motivation. For the first time I heard Uday being acknowledged in a uh, in a large uh, public meeting held in Ahmedabad where David McClelland was the keynote speaker. He spoke and acknowledged about Uday's extension motivation and how his concept of extension motivation stood solidly behind explaining a paradigm for development for all developing nations. That's a wonderful kind of a concept if I found extension motivation. In fact, this concept has a lot more to deal with the concept of extension which has its origins in India. If you want to know a little more about it, you must read Somna Chattopadhyay's article in the book we have written prepared in the memory of Uday Parikh. He talks of in 1950s how this entire extension department came into existence in this country uh, in order to facilitate change in farmers, Indian farmers. It was first in agriculture, later in education, subsequently in health and so on. So Uday borrowed from this concept and he formulated that individuals also had something like a desire to impact uh, on a larger cause, extension, motivation. And he explained that if you want to bring about change in a society, it is very important to have extension motivation. This is not the only contribution and I certainly take a part of the credit along with Uday in formulating the first ever conceptualized integrated human resource development systems at Los Santobro and promoted this particular concept across this country as well as across the world beginning 1975 till the time Uday died and I continue to do it. Uh, that's a great contribution because there is no one else conceptualized an integrated human resource development taking all the lessons from a variety of behavioral science fields. You must design, you must read the principles behind the design of HR systems to understand how much of applied behavioral science has been put into the designing of the HR departments. The third contribution I think Uday Parikh has made is uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, his concepts of role efficacy. Uh, <coughs> following the sense of efficacy of uh, Pfeiffer, Pfizer, I think Uday conceptualized role efficacy and a whole lot of role related concepts including managing role stress and things like that. He explained, I think, using a number of other theories, the poverty and why poverty takes place and so on. I must mention Ishwar Dayal who has made a lot of interesting discoveries by his role analysis technique. Using this technique, he has of course conceptualized, reorganized corporations like State Bank of India and uh, LIC and even today both State Bank and LIC talk of as Ishwar Dayal and SK Bhattacharya's reorganization followed by Uday's facilitation of HRD as the most memorable things in the history of uh, State Bank of India, uh, LIC and things like that. Following this tradition, Prayag Mehta has done a lot on achievement motivation in high school boys and subsequently he continued to work on a new concept called development motivation which explained the efficacy of, uh, uh, efficacy of government officers if they have to be effective and so on. But that was another interesting kind of a concept that came from Indian behavioral scientists.